Aloha. It's Wednesday, July 15th. It's 11 o'clock. It's Trump week. I'm Tim Apicella, your host. And this week's title of the show is Trump gives Roger Stone a get out of jail card free. Uh, let me introduce our guest today. Today, Stephanie Dalton and Winston Welch. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Yeah. Stephanie, let's go to you. Um, as always, a fast and furious week. Um, full of news stories that would, in normal times, would be two or three days of a news cycle. Now it barely merits uh, 10 hours, 15 hours of a news cycle because there's just so much. Uh, drinking out of the fire hydrant, so to speak. Okay, well, you know, Stephanie, Donald Trump basically gave clemency to Roger Stone. He gave him the jail, get out of free jail card. Uh, even, even opposed was uh, the most loyal lackey for Donald Trump. That's William Barr, our attorney general. Even William Barr said he is guilty. Um, what do you think is the most glaring issue of this, this clemency? Again, it wasn't a full pardon. It's, it's basically uh, he won't serve time. Well, um, it's a stunner, um, again, but not surprising that Trump can deliver that. And I'm sure we're in for more. All of the work of the, the good uh, people and uh, who, who went through the trial with him is, I, they must feel exhausted by it. But um, I think that uh, he is eligible to be reindicted, actually, in this arrangement. I, I'm no lawyer and I don't know the details. Yeah, he's also eligible to continue his appeal. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, good. So uh, I did hear that it might be if Trump becomes a private citizen again, he might just get picked up in there, uh, whether it's co unindicted co-conspirator. And I don't think that that's as big an issue with, with the Stone thing as it was with uh, Michael, the lawyer. So um, I think there's a longer story here. If anybody is gonna have the energy to follow up on all of this work in the event that he is a private citizen and eligible for this, these investigations. Uh, so I, I'm, I'll, I'll look forward to that. I, I mean, it's just exhausting now and we know yeah. that he'll do all the others too. So I'm not sure that that's exactly what you wanted, but I, I've stopped really uh, mulling on the very thing anymore. As well, I, I almost made the title of this show Trump's legal quid pro quo. And that is, hey, Roger, you don't talk about me and I'll get you out of the hot seat. Don't talk about what you know about me and all our shady dealings throughout the decades and particularly during the 2016 election and your involvement with WikiLeaks and, and, and Russia. So, um, you know, Donald Trump has basically succeeded in in burying that story and burying that testimony. Um, now, Republicans, they like law and order. And how does this smack with their sense of what law and order is when you basically give someone who is a self-admitted, self-confessed line to the FBI and also witness tampering? He, he, plead, he pled guilty on both those counts. Um, if you're a law and order type of person, uh, how, does this, how does this sit with you? Well, if you're, if I'm still um, being addressed here, I, I think um, it's demoralizing, devastatingly demoralizing. As you say, the Republicans stood for all of these principles and we're just not hearing anything back from them. We're not hearing any pushback and they're not hearing any reminders to the leader about, although he had, he did have the pushback on making the, to, to actually for performing the act and he paid absolutely no attention. So it's another, he's going to do what he wants to do, um, you know, st without consideration for any consequences whatsoever. And that's one thing he's never had. And so that hopefully those will come um, after this. We may be around to, to witness those or we may not, but right now there are no consequences because there are no tools um, for managing this, even though he is admittedly involved in it with Stone and Stone admitted that in the in the interview he gave to a, a, a reporter and it made it clear that they were covering for each other. So what, what are we supposed to do now? With yeah, what do you do now? Uh, Winston, same question. Let me ask you this. Donald Trump says repeatedly now that he is the law and order president. Uh, he drapes himself more with the Confederate flag than he does the United States flag. Um, he's the law and order president yet 
he does everything that smacks in the face of what is considered law and order. And that is uh, dishing out your clemency and or pardons to people that, um, you know, as a favor for keeping silent about you. Uh, same question to you is, how does this smack in the face of people who believe in law and order, even Republicans? Well, it's alternative law and order in an era of alternative facts. Oh, oh, okay. It's, so it's, uh, you know, it's not surprising at all. And we are going to see more of it. And uh, what was the, the article I saw this morning? Will he pardon himself? And is there, is that allowable? And I, the article was going on to say during the Clinton uh, trial, which now seems like like a, like a kindergarten show, um, uh, by comparing what well, it was, uh, that they thought that there was the basis to do that. But that seems like, um, and you know what? It doesn't just we just need to be rid of it we need to move on as a nation as a people every norm has been violated laws have been stretched and abused and manipulated to a point that we don't recognize what is law anymore and the type of order that he may have in mind is not what most americans have in mind and so i think as we're as we're coming clearer and we're coming up for air and you're seeing even a couple a couple of heads breaking the surface from, from uh, former republicans lifting up and saying oh wow where have we been Wh what has gone on you're just seeing basic starts of that as there may be some sort of uh movement away but honestly donald trump is completely supported by his base that is not going to change so anybody who's viewing these um uh, pardons that are going to come down the pike as something that's wrong. They will not view it that they, they will view it that that is a political persecution that needed to be remedied by a presidential pardon. And so I, I don't think it's going to matter at all. And it doesn't matter what Will Bars, William Barr says, or uh, Lindsey Graham or uh, anybody else. I think well, don't I, forget you know, Mitt Romney because Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney his credit. yes, one Republican that's left. Um, what Mitt says is, of course, uh, what Ms. Romney says is, is true, and that this is, you know, an incredible breach of public trust. But we wouldn't, shouldn't, would we expect anything less? I don't yeah. Think so, well, so at okay, this point, would you, Part yeah. B of this question was continuation of a shift in the polling. Uh, Quinnipiac just came out today, showing Donald Trump on a national level, at least. 15 points off from Joe Biden. Um, now we weren't at 15 points. So I, I don't know if it's, you know, one catastrophe story after another that's contributing to these shifting polls, uh, whether it's the, you know, the COVID-19 story that Donald Trump uh, is going out of his way to ignore, or is it his, you know, embracing of the Confederate flag and, and racism as his strategy, or is it now uh, shifting the polls where it's, uh, you know, these, these pardons and clemencies for these crooks, they're crooks. And the bottom line is we don't know like, exactly what recipe is in the mix that's making these polls shift even wider than where they were from a week, two weeks ago. Uh, it seems like people are just exhausted. And if they look around them at the trail of chaos and destruction that has happened over the last four years it doesn't matter what vantage point you're looking from are you happier do you have better relationships now than you did four years ago are you tighter with your neighbors and your friends and your coworkers? is our society more cohesive do we have stronger shared values as a nation people are exhausted and i think that they're just looking for uh, yeah, I saw one never Trumper said he'd just as soon vote for a can of tomato soup at this point. And uh, I think someone said I'd eat a tuna fish sandwich rather than vote for. <laughs> yeah, but we have to realize, I think the important thing is, is that those polls, people not, you have people that, that absolutely support Donald Trump. And if they're, whatever parts that they're supporting that are, um, it, it's hard for us to, to understand it, but we need to understand it after he's gone and, and when he goes, and hopefully we will have an election that results in, in a, uh, 
I don't even call it a victory, but yeah, a win for Joe Biden. But that is the beginning of some reconciliation and healing of the nation. And that's where we really need to look and, and focus our energies because we have been so distracted and bamboozled and just hit between the eyes every single day over the last four years. It's been from the campaign that, that, the, that the assaults on our um, morals, values, integrity, um, it, it, it is, all yeah. of that has been going on for so long that I'm looking forward to what's coming up and how do we begin to process this and and heal as a people and try and understand and um and move on uh and that's where maybe people are looking for and that is why the poll numbers are dropping is so just like we cannot take four more years of this even if i do love 80 percent of what he has to say well this poll number that i'm going to throw out here is going to kind of transition to our next um, topic in question that is you know, it's not just the 52, 37% uh, shifting of, of national polls, even in the swing states now, Joe Biden is in uh, a 12, 13 point lead. And so swing states, of course, are more important statistics than a national poll. But here's one that I think is really um, quite illuminating, if you will. And that is 70% of all um, parents are very, very concerned about sending their kids to school um, and that does touch a lot of Donald Trump's base. That 70% cannot be Democrats and independents alone, has to be some of Donald Trump's loyal followers. And by the way, they're parents. And I would think that even parents, despite their politics, do not want to use their children as experiments for Donald Trump's reelection uh, desires and hopes and dreams. Winston, what do you think about that 70%? you're going to experience the same thing cognitive dissonance that we have had the entire time where you may be aghast at one policy one statement one whatever and even cumulatively but there is a cognitive dissonance between that and then the reality of supporting the continuation of uh, donald trump and everything that he, that he stands for so i'm not uh i don't these polls i don't um Put much stock in them because we saw you know where he was behind uh in the back with the, the race with hillary and he came out ahead because people once they're behind that curtain or in the privacy of you know licking the stamp and putting on the envelope uh how you however you're voting they will they may say one thing but then they, they will do another, another. so yeah. until we get certified you know, uh, and it has to be a big win so that there's no thing. So either he's going to go down kicking and screaming all the way there, or he at some point will say, I want to salvage whatever I have left and try and bring the nation together and have a magnanimous loss. I hope that's what we see. I mean, if anything else, it's just going to be disaster for our country or further disaster, but we'll pick up the pieces and we will move on and we will yeah, emerge. We're going to get to that question before the uh, show is over. Uh, what a post Trump government looks like um, just after this question here. So, hey, Stephanie, if you're a parent and you're, you, you have children that are of school age, um, and let's say you're an avid Trump supporter, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna follow Donald Trump's um, political suggestion and forge ahead and bring your kids to school? Or are you gonna think twice about it and you're gonna do homeschool or, or basically reject Donald Trump's message? Well, remember that if I am that, I have a voice and I'm powerful and I have a president who's doing things that I prefer be done by a president. So I have a particular uh, comfort level with all of this, okay? On the other hand, if I have children and there is this bug out here, this is very scary and I probably will not be willing to risk a child getting sick, much less complicated illnesses and much less dying would really send us back to um, some rudimentary behavior, I think, of beyond civil disobedience. Yeah. You know, Donald Trump basically passed off California as, you know, a liberal, a, a liberal state. And, you know, it's a big mistake if they're going to do uh, internet uh, online learning. Um, but that's, you know, that's California. What do you expect from them? Well, Texas just announced that they're going to do the exact same thing. They're going to go on to online education. Be, and they're going to reject Donald Trump's uh, message about pushing forward to reopen schools. Well, that... I, yeah, oh, I'm, I wanted to quote Arne Duncan, 
and uh, he's been on a couple of times, who was Obama's uh, Secretary of Education. Of course, we saw the current Secretary of Education be completely flabbergasted and inarticulate when she was asked on CNN, what's the plan for a, an occurrence? And that was kind of like asking, asking her, you know, if there's a wild shooter in the hallways of elementary schools, what's your plan? Presumably there's a plan, but on this one with the virus, she had no plan at all. And so then um, Arnie Duncan said uh, that you might, the way Ronald, uh, Donald Trump, there is for him, there is no number. There's no 50 kids dead. There's no hundred of people dead. There's no 500 people gone. There's no thousands being sick and ill and on the way to uh, those trucks that they're all hauling in now because they need more space for the bodies. That will not move him. He is totally unaffected by any of those numbers. So there is nothing there to motivate him to pay attention to the actual circumstances that he's putting the children in and the concerns that the parents have, much less the teachers who have to go in and be accosted by. Uh, you know, uh, just multiple sources of infection potentially. So I, I think that, that that was good advice. He said, do not pay attention to him. You go to your local leaders and you, your local people that you've elected and put in place and they will make the decisions about the schools. So I think that that gives us um, a way of thinking about everything with, with any, trying, any trying to solve the problem by Donald Trump is uh, about he doesn't really care about it, except insofar as it approaches his own needs to be elected. And he brought it up on the day that we had the book coming out by his niece. So it was brought up only because that he, it's not like he cared about getting the school topic on the agenda, but he was trying to distract from the niece's book coming out that day. So that was That's another- a good point. That's a good point, Stephanie. You know, just going to illustrate a little bit of his thinking when asked about, you know, parents concern about sending their children to school. Donald Trump basically said schools should be open. Schools should be open. Kids want to go to school and they're losing a lot of our lives by keeping things closed. We saved a lot of lives. We saved millions of lives and we did it for the national good. Um, he, so what he's doing, he's grasping on the fact that, well, two or three million people haven't died. So that's success. I mean, he's, he's changed the narrative of what success looks like uh, that is not two or three million uh, lives lost. It's, you know, 137,000. And that's, that's a big difference. It could have been two or three million. So he's, he's trying to redefine the bar of success. And he's trying to ram that down the throat of parents that really aren't going to play ball with this idea. Well, not when it comes to the children. Now, not when it I, comes to children. I mean, and I, okay, I can understand people are distracted from that by the current concerns they all have themselves. But but Trump is only interested in getting parents back to work. If he has any any uh, or in the water here, it's only about getting the babysitting system going again. Not anything about the quality of education or the way it's going to be done or or preserving the lives of all the people in that industry. And that is what is so deplorable is it at no time has he spoken to the numbers of people that are down and when he does it it's kind of you know very it's flat it's flat it just falls flat on his face no empathy no anything no i'm going to work do everything i can to have not one more life given over to this bug uh there's just nothing um that he's done in that regard so it's really quite quite frightening and um i i don't know power is is what is very magical uh, and, and people will do anything for power. But I think that when it gets down to risk in the children of the nation, I don't know. I don't think uh, that woman you asked me to be for a while, I think that might get some thinking going. Okay. But Thank you, Stephanie. Winston, um, you might've heard of a gentleman by the name of Chuck Woolery. This was yes. the uh, game show host for the Love Connection. And Chuck Woolery, um, I didn't know he was a scientist, and I don't think he is a scientist, but he had a, an opinion that Donald Trump actually agreed with, and he retweeted it, and then later on kind of mimic, basically restated it, saying that the COVID-19 is basically a hoax. So this is what Chuck Woolery stated. The most outrageous lies are the ones about COVID-19. Everyone is lying. The CDC, 
media, Democrats, or doctors, not all, but most, we are told to trust. I think all of us is about the election, keeping the economy from coming back, which I think it's about the election. I'm sick of it. So Donald Trump is saying, yeah, this hoax of a virus, which he initially back in February said it was a democratic hoax. Then, you know, he switched positions to say, okay, it's real and we're gonna do what we can. And we're gonna, we're gonna try to clamp things down. Now he's back to, I'm not gonna pay attention to it. It's irrelevant. I've moved past it. I'm on to the election, my re-election. And by the way, Chuck Woolery, he knows exactly what he's talking about because it's still a hoax. Um, your comments about Chuck Woolery and his statement and the fact I that- I like better they're... as a game show host. Bingo, um, bingo. I, yeah, you, you know, you think about this um, and it's not that ordinary citizens shouldn't be concerned and involved. So to that effect, uh, to that level, that's that's great. But to have the president of the United States retweeting something like this, hey, let's, there was incredible progress. So if it's a hoax, we have to remember Donald Trump wore a mask this week when visiting a hospital, Walter Reed. So if it's a hoax, then he's, I don't know what the point of that. I, I, I cannot imagine how much people cajoled and pleaded with him to do that. But you know, there's an interesting article by George Will, um, who is a conservative columnist, says, Today, the nation is in a downward spiral. Worse is yet to come. And uh, it says it hasn't reached it. The spiral has not reached its nadir yet, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. worse can confidently be expected. And the nation's floundering government is now administered by a gangster regime. This is from the conservative yeah. columnist. Yeah, Will Gangster regime. That's, that's incredible to hear from George, George Will. Will. And, um, you know, that's just it. It is, we're looking at this... Um, so there may be some intellectual components that are starting to come over and realize it for what it is and the damage that's being done. And obviously George will, but you saw this in a couple of other things, but even Lindsey Graham, when he, when he started to peep out his head a little bit, I'm just wondering, did the, his handlers tell him to do what, what was the gain in that? Because I, you know, we still, the, the loyalty is to Donald Trump and we have to realize that and say, so as we look beyond, and I know you wanted to get to that question is, how do we move beyond Donald Trump and, and Trumplican values and get back to American values where we say we don't put children in cages? Like that is a, that's just a, can we all agree on that? But despite anything else and those types of questions, but well, we're not there yet. And we're not going to get there with this. And we're not, no, because we don't share those. I mean, that is what is so interesting because these people are in power and it's their value system that is running these things, which is Trump's and all of the, 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 the people that are in that administration. They are enacting a different value system from what traditionally George Will would agree and all of these people that are rejecting it. It is not going to be- Stephanie, if, if the leader of this, uh, what I call, I'll quote Hillary Qu uh, Clinton, basket of deplorables will the basket of deplorables switch around once their leader of deplorable <laughs> is gone no. will they go where have we been what nightmare have we we zombie walked through and my yeah. god what have we done are they going to come around and say let's let's bring america back again is that what the post-trump america is going to look like are they going to see kind of where they've been and they are they going to yeah. Back to the fold, so to speak. Because I finally got to grapple with it. These people are not just mistaken others who will come around to agree with me. These people have their own views. They are real. We have to learn them. We have to work with them. We, we don't want them in power. So the majority does not want that in power because when they're in power, then they will influence what we do, like they have the Senate. And I remember when we got the House in, in uh, 18, it was thrilling, but I said, wait, wait, what's happening over at the Senate? Because without the Senate, you're still subject, okay? And oh, aren't we subject to it? So these people are there, they've been there. That's one of the reasons they're so tightly bound because they have the power, they have their spokesperson. Well, they I, I guess I'm referring to a political shift versus a cultural shift. And the question is culturally, does the polarization begin to ease up a little bit between all Americans 
and culturally do we come together a little bit more about what constitutes decency, what constitutes um, what is right, the rule, the rule of law, uh, what constitutes um, getting along with your neighbor, not because it's a blue state or a red state, because we're all Americans. Does they, that start to shift? Does that start to change? Answers to that. This is the whole pro thing that 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 Hamilton and discussion about it is brought up. They had to get that constitution together, so they didn't get a lot of things done. Okay, as we know, slavery, as a few other things. Then we ended up a hundred years later, or fifty years later, hundred fifty, with the Civil War because we didn't get this stuff fixed. Right. And we didn't work on this stuff. And now we had the Civil War and we finished that. And obviously we didn't get that stuff fixed. And it's still eking out now another 150 years later because there are these different positions. For all, it, it, it has some to do with states' rights. Okay, I mean, we can see that. And that's all my Dalton Southern relatives, in-laws ever talked about was the war between the states. They never called it a civil war there, Southern as North Carolina. The point is that it was a war between the states and it was about states' rights, okay? that So we still have that going on, that the state should be, and we just saw it with all the governors and Trump is going with that. You guys, you state solve this thing. That was what the civil war was about. State that's right. That's all they ever told me it was about, even though I asked about, well, what about slavery? Nobody cared about it at that time. <laughs> well, yeah. that's different. Well, but guess what? Um, I not... made a mistake. I made a mistake today. And that is I put this very important question towards the tail end of the show. And uh, I should have put it in the very top of the show so that we could dedicate the time really required to talk about what our government, what our society looks like after Donald Trump, assuming that Donald Trump's not around. So the bottom line is, um, I think in the next show, we're going to put this same question, same topic, a little bit further up in the agenda. So before we end today, Stephanie, what's your prediction for this coming week? I think it's going to be just as hard and harder. And I think especially as the polls rise, um, I, I think that he's going to get more and more unwieldy and he's going to do more and more things. Like I said, what would, I think there'll be more, more outrageous. More outrageous. He's got a lot of time, so it might not all come this week because we, I just realized we've got to deal with this through January. Yeah. So he's got plenty of time to play around with this stuff. So there could be some stuff this week. I don't know what it might be, but I do think, you know, he's, he's going to be derogating Biden more, much more. Something else is going to come out about that. Maybe that's my one concrete. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. Winston, to you, uh, predictions for the, the week coming? more exhaustion uh, you know I, at this point i think we just have to we're just writing it out and no matter we we just have to have faith that that we will come together and i i i, I totally appreciate what stephanie's saying we'll find the common values again uh there's just been a voice given to awfulness and no one's very few people will want to admit i've been a deplorable for the last four years i'm i'm a deplorable uh what we have to say is okay we don't share all of our values in common, but what do we share in common? And as we've devolved to a states' rights model and a new federalism, I think that's where the emphasis is going to go. And we have common things that are going to be kind of knocked down, and then different states and different regions are going to band together that have different shared values. And I see that's that would be my trend for the future. But this week, we will just pray for Ruth Bader Ginsburg and all of our leaders uh, that. She's been she released from the hospital, by the way. Good health. She is yeah. in the hospital. So we will pray for, for their good health and good decisions, no matter who they are, while they are in power. All righty. Well, by the way, she has been released from the hospital. That's what good, I wanted to good. try to tell you. Yeah. Well, I still all right. that's very extra hard anyway. Yeah, that she stays out of the hospital. So, all right. Uh, Stephanie Dalton, Winston Welch, thank you so much for joining us on Trump Week. See us next week, 11 o'clock Wednesday. I'm Tim Apatel, your host. Aloha.